Good afternoon, everyone. So this is the network virtualization panel. Uh, we're going to talk with a number of the uh, vendors and users of network virtualization and talk about its current state, what we think it's going to in the future, and a little bit about how that impacts OpenStack. So before we get too much started here, I want to have people introduce themselves. I'll obviously go first. My name's Ken Peppel. I'll be moderating today. I'm not with any of the vendors here. Um, but I'll let each one of them actually introduce themselves and a little bit about their solution and their company. Dan? Hi, uh, good afternoon. Everybody here? Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Dan Dimitriou. I'm the CTO of uh, Midokura. And uh, we have a virtual network overlay solution for OpenStack handling uh, layer two to layer four. Um, please stop by our booth later. I can tell you more in detail about exactly what we do. But basically, we cover uh, the gamut of the OpenStack networking function from uh, floating IP, NAT, security groups, virtual layer two, layer three isolation. Thank you. Um, I'm Mike Cohen. I'm director of strategic alliances for Big Switch Networks. We are a platform independent software defined networking vendor. Um, you know, our, our solution is distinct in that it actually is a platform for a number of SDN networking applications. And network virtualization turns out to be one of the, one of the key solutions built on top of that. Um, you know, if you look inside our solution, you know, there's probably um, two distinguishing elements of it. Uh, one is that it's actually designed around open standards and open APIs. Um, and this is actually very, very key to offering programmable interfaces and being able to interoperate with things like OpenStack. Um, the other one is actually, um, in addition to an overlay solution, we actually offer a uh, physical and um, you know, and virtual and virtual or hypervisor based solution where we can actually see the entire network and rather than offer you know in addition to offering overlays we can actually give you a consolidated view of your network um, and and actually allow people to control the entire network so my name is Gavin Pratt I'm the product management lead for cloud storage and networking at HP cloud services um, so HP is a big company we're a uh, both a vendor and a user of software-defined networking. Uh, and we've had some announcements uh, the past month or so, and happy in Q&A to get into that in more detail. But um, you know, from the cloud service provider perspective, um, you know, we're operating one of the largest OpenStack-based public clouds. And um, you know, we plan to move. I mean, Quantum wasn't originally part of OpenStack, but now that they're you know, bringing it in, it's getting more stable. We're planning to support Quantum uh, with an SDN controller. And happy to chat more about that. And again, obviously, on the um, Hardware side and the private cloud side, we're planning to be involved there as well. Um, again, there were some announcements last week or two on that, and happy to elaborate in Q and A. Excellent. So I've got a number of questions that I'll be asking them here over the next ten or twenty minutes, and then we'll open up for audience questions. When we do open up for audience questions, I'd ask you to come up to the front microphone, uh, since we are recording this. If you could speak up so that people who actually see this later can hear it, um, but I'll open it up for them then. But let's start with. What do you believe the current best use cases for network virtualization or software-defined networking are within the context of the cloud? And since I started with Dan last time, I'll start with Gavin this time. Yeah, no thanks. So, um, you know, I, I think one thing that's worth mentioning is, you know, I think software-defined networking is really important. I think that's why um, you know, the quantum sessions seem to be packed, every one of them. Um, and HP is a very big believer in SDN. But it's worth noting that SDN is not right for every customer and every use case. Um, I think some of the first adopters we're seeing of SDN are the cloud service providers. Um, I think we're starting to see some large enterprises as well. And that really revolves around two key value propositions of SDN that I think SDN is somewhat uniquely positioned to address. So one is enabling um, network isolation at the dependent layer um, for large multi-tenant clouds. It's, it's very hard to scale VLANs in a, especially in a multi-tenant way, um, at the scale that HP and Rackspace and Amazon Web Services are operating at. So that's one important way you know, from the cloud service provider perspective. Another important use case is when you look at large enterprises, I mean, so BRE uh, in the HP keynote earlier today was talking about um, the whole notion of the production workload at the enterprise level and how enterprises need to be able to span different data centers in a true hybrid cloud way. And, a lot of people talk about hybrid cloud, but it's something that currently just a lot of people are talking about. Um, but to really enable hybrid cloud, you need to be able to have a single network topology that spans multiple data centers um, and do things like handle um, IP address overlapping 
um, stuff like that. And so that's the second large use case we see in the near term. Yeah. So I would probably describe you know three key drivers we're seeing around network virtualization. Um, you know, the f and they're really speed, scale, and efficiency. So speed becomes important in sort of the rate of change that happens in in cloud, you know, in cloud environments in the network. You know, it's no longer feasible for someone to actually, you know, modify a particular switch or, or modify how a VLAN trunking, you know, behaves in, in a network in a cloud environment. That ends up too slow for the way clouds are actually supposed to behave. They need to be, you know, they need to allow, you know, second base provisioning, not, you know, file a ticket and wait a week. Um, so, th so that's driver number one. Scale tends to be the, uh, you know, another big driver, which is, you know, actually, you know, using something like a VLAN, you know, you know, you're, there are you know 4,096 VLANs available, and that turns out not to you know you know not to scale to really large multi-tenant environments. So as people are building clouds today, you know they don't want to build them with that inherent <laughs> cliff. Um, you know, basically designed in from the get-go, and SDN can offer an essentially an unlimited scaling ability. And the last one is efficiency, and it's you know the idea that you you actually end up um, you know you know prior to SDN you may end up with stranded capacity in in your cloud data center where you are. Oh, you know, a workload can't actually take advantage of another part of your cloud because you know, the network won't actually stretch to allow it to do so. Um, you know, SDN and programmable networks can actually allow the network to morph just as flexibly as the, the hypervisor virtualization layer to allow you to really use every bit of computing um, and you know, computing and other resources in your cloud. Yeah, so I think these guys pretty much covered it. But if I was to add my, <laughs> my two cents to the, to the point here, uh, we've been focused on infrastructure as a service, um, network virtualization for a while. So the, so the problems that come up there are, of course, the way you do isolation in an environment where you really want to decouple the location and the identification of, uh, of VMs and virtual resources. And that's why we chose the overlay approach to that. So uh, we're talking about SDN in general. SDN is such a broad thing. It's about programmability and agility of hardware pieces as well as software. For solving the network virtualization use case for infrastructure as a service, like OpenStack, the overlay approach seems to make the most sense because it allows us to completely decouple the location of things from their, uh, from their identification, right, including enabling the migration, without relying on the traditional isolation mechanisms of VLANs or even MPLS VPNs or VRFs, which may or may not be available in lower end hardware, let's say. And it also allows us to do all this in software at the edge of the network. And I think it was also mentioned before, but by doing this at the edge of the network, we can also, uh, we don't need to actually update any sort of state in the physical network, in the core. The core can stay rather you know, solid only if there's a failure of a link or an actual hardware device do we need to actually update uh, network state there. All the virtual network state, it gets updated at the edge. Great. So if we were going to have the same conversation, I was going to ask you about these same use cases, but we were in Barcelona perhaps <laughs> next, next fall. What do you think that future use case, that best future use case that you're looking towards? And I'll start with you this time, Dan. Well, that's a tough one, actually. I, I don't know if I can think that far ahead, but basically uh, we're looking at multi-site uh, multi use cases. I think that's going to come up more and more. Right now we've basically effectively been focused on uh, single site network virtualization. Uh, so I think that's gonna come up. People talk about cloud bridging a lot more and the, the hybrid cloud use cases, of course, uh, of multiple kinds, you know, interconnecting Amazon with Rackspace, but you know, that's been tried. The providers actually have to play nice in order to make that kind of seamless. But uh, a lot of it is uh, hybrid cloud on-premise connecting with uh, the public clouds. So that's definitely one of the biggest ones. So I would say, at, you know, at a high level, some of the use cases I talked about previously are going to continue to be true, you know, very much so. But, you know, if I kind of think ahead about other things that, you know, SDN and network virtualization will enable, um, you know, we're beginning to see, um, you know, a lot of requests for layer four through seven services and, and how we can help those vendors basically integrate, you know, integrate into a, a virtual networking domain and, and expose their services efficiently. Um, so I think that's, that's one, you know, you know, really key driver. I think we're going to start seeing things like, you know, an intelligent network where you can actually, you know, the, the network can actually start working with, you know, things like a Nova scheduler and actually give it information about what's going on in the network and help it intelligently place VMs for particular workloads. So I think you're going to, you're, you're going to start seeing a network that's very API driven um, and can actually start exposing information and now tightly integrating with other pieces of OpenStack. And I think that'll be where things start getting very exciting. 
So I mean, certainly when you're thinking, you know, six months out, I don't know that the use cases will necessarily be dramatically different than at least the two that I was talking about earlier, but I think, we know, they'll, they'll get better. And so, you know, first of all, when you think about it from a cloud service provider perspective, offering, um, you know, multi-tenant um, network isolation at scale, I think you'll see the better ability to do that at scale. So one challenge with SDN is, on the one hand, there's this camp that says, you know, let's pull out the control plane, have a central control plane, and then you can handle all the uh, devices. But the problem is it doesn't scale super well. So how do you, on the one hand, centralize a control plane, but at the same time distribute it so that it actually doesn't have um, performance bottlenecks, such as your single points of failure or some general databases that don't operate well at scale. So I think you'll, you know, as you start seeing people handle this, you know, centralized yet distributed model, that would be one thing. Um, and also kind of like you know, we were saying earlier, um, we're bridging multiple sites. I think, you know, initially you're gonna see that as a somewhat, um, you know, um, non-automated process, but I think, you know, down the road, I think you'll see much more automation and integration across clouds. And like they were saying, you know, we have to all play nice with each other. And, you know, I, I think certainly one, you know, kind of request to the community is, when we look at Quantum, currently a lot of functionalities in the core APIs. There's also a lot of functionality that's currently being delivered by different vendors via different extensions. And that, that's not really sustainable if we want to see true um, inter-cloud operability. And, and certainly, you know, Long term, we'd like to see you know automation and management and security tools can kind of go on top of that, but um, to facilitate it more. But long term, we need to see more um, functionality moving to the core APIs versus proprietary, proprietary extensions. And once we see that, then I think we're going to see an explosion of different use cases and value-added um, software and services that will um, you know enhance those two use cases I described. Excellent. So we've talked a little bit about why people might be moving towards network virtualization. What do you think the biggest obstacles, though, that are really facing people that are looking to embrace that today? And I'll start with Gavin down at the end again. Yeah, um, at the risk of being like a broken record, so on the cloud service provider perspective, uh, many SDN controllers don't work well at, I'll call it at scale, but when I say at scale, I mean, you know, the, um, you know, like the HP, Amazon um, scale. Certainly you can operate a small cloud with, you know, even the free open source SDN controllers out there, but to actually work at scale, you need, um, you know, a, a much more uh, complicated and yet elegant solution. And so that's something that um, I think one thing people are struggling with. Um, and then again, on, on that second use case, um, I think we already talked earlier, but just having the technology and the open standards um, to facilitate the cross-cloud interconnection, I think, is another key issue. And I guess I'll mention a third thing, which is, um, you know, so eBay, for example, was one of the first adopters of um, SDN, and they're using NICERA. But if you look carefully, they're doing it just for a small dev test workload right now. And so one thing that people are struggling with is even if they decide SDN is right for my company, and by the way, it's, it's not right for certain companies, but for them it might be right, how do you rip out the entire um, network control plane and, and replace with an SDN controller without destabilizing your business? And so we're already seeing some vendors starting to think about that and start to develop solutions, but basically having a seamless migration path that enterprises are gonna require, at least for non-greenfield deployments, uh, I think is something that needs a lot more development before we see widespread adoption in existing um, networking infrastructure. You know, I would say, you know, one of the bigger barriers, you know, we're seeing right now is a bit of kind of a mind shift, a mind, you know, you know a mind shift that needs to happen in terms of how people think about networks and the, you know, what are the inherent constraints of networks. So SDNs actually, you know, start eliminating a lot of the things you thought you could not do in networking. You can actually now do because your network is, is very is open and programmable. Um, but you actually have, you know, the people that have been running networks for many years are used to the way things operate and they're used to a set of primitives. Um, so it's, you know, there's kind of a bit of re-education and, and, you know, thoughtfulness that kind of ha has to happen in a community to really understand these new capabilities and how to deploy them. Um, and probably the other area I would highlight is, you know, deploying software-defined networking in a cloud is very much an, an integration play. So, you know, your network touches, you know, you know touches, you know, all pieces of your cloud, right? It's very important that it integrates with your servers. It's, you know, it's very important that it integrates with, you know, whatever kind of WAN solution you, ha you have in place and whatever orchestration stack you're using. Um, you know, so it's actually really important that, you know, SDNs, you know, basically build these integrations and, and can actually deploy seamlessly across them. And I think that's, you know, that's happening very quickly right now, but that's gonna be one of the things that will drive adoption very aggressively. Yeah. 
Um, those are all great points. And I would say one thing that I think is relevant to all our software-based overlay solutions is a question of trust. You know, basically the networking gear has been assumed to be something that's like this hardened piece of hardware that's delivered by a vendor and it just basically works seamlessly. I mean, I know some people are gonna sit laugh because there are bugs all the time, but surely it is not like a piece of OpenStack or even some piece of Linux software. It's something that's assumed to be much more hardened. And with the uh, SDN and overlay solutions, it's all brand new software. It's very new. So it's gonna take a while to establish that trust and confidence that this stuff actually works in a you know, really mission critical environment. I think that's one issue. Another issue I think that might have been touched on is about troubleshooting. If you're using uh, very new ways of routing traffic around or encapsulated, you know, a lot of the traditional tools maybe don't work anymore. We have to build new processes for that. And that surely will take time. And I think the vendors, we have a responsibility to make sure that we offer either reasonable alternatives or integrate with the existing solutions, if that makes sense. Great. So one of the other things that have come up quite a bit and is especially uh, appropriate in the, the quantum community has been the issue of openness and the openness of solutions, especially within regard to vendor lock-in. So kind of a two-part question. On your particular solution, which parts are open and which parts are closed? And how important do you feel that is in the short term? Dan? That's a great question. Actually, probably the toughest for us here because actually right now none of our solution is open except our integration with, uh, with, with Quantum and OpenStack. So I think you know, we can answer this in several ways. Uh, in terms of vendor lock-in, if the API is standardized as Quantum aims to be, as more and more of the APIs move in there, uh, that certainly should alleviate some of the vendor lock-in um, concerns. Ultimately, I think we will have uh, open source solutions for the entire stack, uh, but that'll probably take some time. You know, so in the meantime, uh, something like Quantum is great because it facil facilitates the common API that somebody could use, but I think given the heterogeneity of the solutions, it's gonna be a little bit tough to, to find like true commonality all the way. Uh, even if the stuff were open source, that wouldn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, the pain of switching is actually uh, not there. And that, after all, I think that's the, that's the idea of vendor lock-in is you can always switch to another vendor. Just how painful is it, right? It's gonna be painful no matter what at some point. Sure. Yeah. And I would say at Big Switch, we've taken a much more aggressive stance towards open source and open standards um, you know, than I guess we've, we've seen in other parts of the market. So we have the core, the, the, the core of our controller, you know, the, the kernel that actually speaks down to different switches in the network is open source. It's Apache license. Um, it's a project called Floodlight. And this is something we actually embed in, in the commercial controller that we ship. Um, so that's actually you know, one big piece we're doing, and this is available to the community. And, and in fact, Floodlight has its own community building around it, um, you know, build, you know, building different SDN applications. Um, the other thing we've been doing is trying to stay very, very close to, to open standards. So um, you know, our, our controller speaks a, a, number, a number of protocols down to different switches. OpenFlow is one of them. Um, and you know, OpenFlow has been friendly to us because you know, it is a standard. It's, a, it's being picked up by a number of vendors on the physical switching side, and it's also showing up in hypervisor switches. Um, and then we're obviously gonna, you know, we'll extend that to support VXLAN and VGRE and, and, you know, and, and different protocols as they become you know, really, you know, really tightly supported standards as well. But um, you know, I think this is where you know, what's going to really drive SDN is re you know, really you know, solidifying these standards and, and you know, people using open source and open standards as the foundation for these platforms. And that's what we've been doing, you know, I, I think, from the very foundation of the company, really. Yeah. Um, so, so HP is pretty similar. Um, you know, certainly, when you think about any of the interconnection points that a customer might ever interact with, <coughs> we have a firm commitment to making sure those are on, um, if not open source, at least open standards. So that there, you know, there will not be vendor lock-in. The one thing we did talk about earlier, though, is, um, you know, currently again, Quantum has a small set of core APIs, and it requires you, by definition, to use extensions to those APIs for a lot of the advanced layer three and other functionality. So that's something that HP and I think Cisco and others are pushing aggressively to get, you know, more of those into the core API. And we generally want that because it's better for us as a community if more of these clouds are um, can interconnect. Um, so I guess that that's the one limitation, and it's a limitation, I think, for all of us. Um, but again, we're firm backers of that. But certainly when you think about things like, you know, if I want to, you know, create a, you know, a tunnel between the HP public cloud and my on-premise enterprise data center, you know, that, that's going to be entirely via open source, open standards, um, you know, such as IPsec. And, um, you know, we're certainly be supporting, although not requiring, 
um, OpenFlow on um, you know, switches and routers. So certainly if you have that, it'll probably work best. If you don't have OpenFlow, it'll, our controller will still work, but it you know, maybe won't work quite as fast. But I mean, OpenFlow is an open standard, and um, HP is an active contributor to that community. Great. So we've talked a lot about use cases, and, and it seems a, a very clear use case in the service provider markets. But a lot of people here are probably looking at using OpenStack as a private cloud solution. And so do you see big drivers today that will push private clouds to actually use network virtualization? Or do you think that's going to come further down, probably down the pipe later? Gavin? Yeah, I mean, I think that there definitely is a reason to use that. So, you know, I think long term, we'll never see most companies using a full public cloud model. And part of it is just based on the economics. It often makes sense to kind of have your base load capacity be something that you kind of have pre-bought and you've kind of locked in and then pay per use for, you know, Flexroom and, and, um, and special projects and things like that. So the implication then is you need to be able to have your private cloud interconnect in with public clouds to get that full promise of the cloud, being able to kind of flex up resources as you need to. Um, so the implication is then that you have to be using um, some form of SDN so you can, you know, flex into the cloud um, but, you know, without having to you know, break into a different network topology, which often makes it hard for legacy applications to function that way. Yeah, I can say definitively, we're, you know, we're seeing demand today in the in the enterprise for for private cloud deployments, you know, with with OpenStack. And the use cases really go back to what I said before, you know, speed, scale, and efficiency. They're there's you know very similar to what you know, you know, very there's strong overlap at least with what service providers are demanding. Um, you know, the, the one caveat I guess I'll put on it, if you're deploying an extremely small private cloud, you know, a single rack potentially, um, you know, network virtualization, you know, a lot of its value is about, uh, you know, operating at scale. So if you have a very, very small environment, you know, to some degree any, you know, in a single switch, for example, any environment, you know, any amount of networking would probably work for you. You don't need something as complex. But if you're deploying at any scale, you often run into the same problem service providers do. And that's what we're seeing in our customers. Right, so I just wanted to say that you know a private cloud doesn't necessarily mean that it's a small one, right? So in that sense, it could be a large cloud, even inside the enterprise. Also, the IT, the internal cloud inside an enterprise could operate very much like a service provider, you know, for different business units. So in that sense, I think there is a lot of overlap. And I would say also that even at the smallest of scales, maybe even at the one rack level, uh, network virtualization can add fault tolerance. Um, so in that sense, it does add value there at, for really not actual, not much cost in terms of complexity. So I think it actually does add value at, uh, at all layers. Excellent. So a lot of people today, when they talk about security and security in the cloud, is really being enforced or sometimes hindered really by networking. What do you feel like uh, SDN or network virtualization, what effect do you feel like that has on security today in the cloud? Not my area of ex expertise, but uh, I'll give it a go. You know, I, I think the, in the cloud, the security is very much uh, driven by the hypervisor, right? So you have to have the hypervisor as part of your you know, trusted computing domain. And in that sense, uh, in a solution like ours, like an overlay-based solution, uh, the software that runs on the edge also has to be part of the trusted computing uh, base. So it has to be hardened so that it is not vulnerable to internal or external threats. Um, that said, th there are a lot of different kinds of security here, right? Like there's threats from inside the cloud, there's uh, threats from people snooping on the actual physical network. Those have to be hardened by encryption and you know, basically uh, authenticating and encrypting the control paths as well. There's also threats from outside. Uh, and of course, network virtualization can help there by uh, providing much more visibility into um, the traffic that's going on at the edges possibly getting that into some sort of IDS analysis and really quickly responding to threats by blocking relevant traffic, again, at the edges without involving uh, changes to the, to the physical network, which might have to go through various types of uh, vendor-specific scripts or God knows what tools. I mean, until every single device out there is uh, programmable by an open standard like OpenFlow or what have you, um, doing things in software is still gonna be a lot more flexible. So um, yeah, lots of things. Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, from a security perspective, there's both challenges and opportunities. And, you know, in the challenge department, it's very much that, you know, 
this is a new this is a new networking paradigm. You know, you're changing you know you're changing the deployment structure you you used before, and you know people need to understand what those differences are and 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 the corner cases around them to make sure that you know, you know mistakes are not made. Um, you know, but I, there's nothing inherently that makes things less secure. It's just you know the world is changing. You need to learn. You, you need to learn how to adapt. Um, the big opportunity, which you know, I think is significant, is actually created um, in the an SDN controller actually has this global view of the you know of all, every piece, every element in the network and all the different hosts and how and actually at the point at which they're communicating with with each other. So it actually gives you. You know, it, it actually gives you a central policy location where you can decide exactly who can communicate with who and how. Um, and this actually creates a really interesting opportunity to enforce tighter security than you did before. And you know, this can be you know, you know this can be at the edge um, using edge-based devices. Um, you know, to the degree your virtual network spans into the physical domain, it can also encompass physical physical firewalls as well, and making sure those policies are synced up with your virtual networks. So, you know, at the end of the day, you may actually end up with a better automated solution that can deliver better security than you have today. Um, you know, but obviously the challenge around that is you need to understand how to put all these pieces together properly. Okay. So, I mean, I, I definitely agree with what's been said so far. I guess just to elaborate, I mean, from a theoretical perspective, it's easier to hack software than hack hardware. And so, you know, certainly, um, you know, where we're taking security very seriously at HP and certainly, um, you know, uh, we'd argue it's important to go with a trusted vendor. Um, you know, could be HP, could be somebody else, but um, you know, has a history of um, you know taking security things very seriously at the enterprise level, and um, you know, we're certainly leveraging some of our technologies like Tipping Point and ArcSight and, and others um, in, in the SDN space to make sure we are you know we are doing doing things like um, intrusion detection and and others. Um, but, but like we said, you know, as long as you do it right, I think there are opportunities and. Um, certainly, even in the near term, I mean, just offering tenant isolation, which is impossible at scale without SDN, um, at least in an elegant way, um, is you know exciting. So, I guess you know to sum up, you know, there's lots of opportunity, but um, you know you want to make sure you have somebody that you can trust and has a track record in the space, and um, you know, security is not something to take lightly. Great. So I'm going to ask one last question, but while I'm asking and they're answering, feel free to cue at the microphone so we can have audience questions here. So on my last question will be, what are your hopes or what specific features would you like to see in Quantum to come out at the end of Grizzly? Gavin. So obviously security groups are one of the key features that I know we were trying to push into Folsom 3, and I think, it's, I think currently the plan is for Grizzly 1, if not Grizzly 2. So I mean, the key is you know to fully move over to Quantum first, we just need to have um, feature parity with the existing Nova networking model, and so that, that's one of the big gaps. So obviously, um, it's on people's radar. It, it is happening, but that's probably feature number one. I, th I think feature number two is, I think we like we were all talking about is having more and more of that functionality get into the core APIs. Um, you know, because again, the full promise of SDN, um, certainly, certainly from a user perspective, you know, you know, going beyond just cloud service providers, really depends upon having clouds. Um, be able to interconnect via open standards, and that's not really possible until you have more functionality at the core API level. So a lot of progress is being made there, um, but it is something that we as a community need to um, push. So I'm, I'm personally very excited by the work being done around layer four through seven services and how they integrate into quantum APIs as well. Um, you know, quantum, you know, Quantum's made a huge amount of progress defining things at layer two and layer three, and you know, what we're hearing now from people, and you know, we're also seeing other networking vendors interested in saying, well, how, you know, how do we integrate higher level networking services into the same framework? And you know, Quantum's just now tackling that problem, um, and I think that'll be, I think that'll be worked out in the Grizzly timeframe, and I think that'll, you know, it'll offer a great solution to people where they can actually do kind of an end-to-end -end kind of full network stack provisioning uh, in, in a net virtual networking sense, um, and I think you know, that's probably the next big challenge for, for quantum. Okay. Well I, I see the I see the quantum API situation divided into two I mean not just quantum but basically the the OpenStack uh, network API situation divided into two areas. The tenant facing APIs, which basically I think need to be figured out and be very stable, right? So in that area I think we should take our cue from AWS. I mean, not because we can't uh, be more creative than that, but because there's so much there to do before we start getting more creative like you know, IPsec, VPN gateways, uh, all kinds of stuff. And on the other side, right, like ELB, 
load balancing services, you know, that's been a hot topic. There's like four sessions on that uh, these days. Um, and then on the other side, uh, the provider side APIs of, of Quantum, I mean, they're extremely immature. There's almost nothing there. So th each vendor presumably is doing their own thing, you know, for the, uh, for the provider side. And I'm sure that's going to, that adds to the vendor lock in the pain of switching out, right? So the provider stuff needs to be standardized just as well as the tenant. Of course, not as much, but it's also important. So. Good. Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, so picking up on the, the topic of layer four through seven services, what layer four through seven services do you think will be most popular other than load balancing? Yeah, well, that's an obvious one. Yeah. Um, and where do you believe that the best way to integrate that in will be? So there's been a few different ways out there that you've seen in the market today. One was really around automating hardware. There were also a lot of talk of just doing software appliances. Yeah. Other people have actually looked for real services, uh, people like Embrain and such. Where do you feel that that's going for layer four through seven services? Definitely load balancing, top priority, right? Because it's a fundamental requirement. Um, maybe deep packet inspection firewalls, things like that. Um, I have to say, I really don't believe in integrating the hardware appliances into the, into the model because we're an overlay solution. So I think probably you all know why we don't believe in that. Uh, and I think it also complicates things quite a bit, right? So uh, I like the Embrane model, you know, fundamentally, the scalable software appliances. Um, we'll see how it goes, you know. So, um, you know, I, I agree in terms of services people are interested in, it's going to be obviously load, load balancing would be number one, um, you know, firewalls will probably be number two, and there'll be a number of kind of other security, intrusion detection, for example, may, you, know, you know, maybe also pretty high on the list, uh, you know, a, as things, you know, people are interested in. In terms of the model that, that ends up winning here, um, you know, Again, I, you know, I probably have the view that it's going to be probably a mix of, of you know, of edge-based and, and hardware appliances. Um, you know, um, so we don't actually build solutions at this level. We, we work with partners, and the partners I've talked to, um, you know, the the hardware the hardware boxes tend to have a you know kind of a, you know some different use cases and, and some you know you know fundamental capabilities that you know, some of which can be matched and some of which can't be matched in, in the virtual appliances. So I ultimately think the you know the solution will probably end up being you know needs to support a mix of these um, you know for a while you know. And and I you know honestly believe the APIs we, we develop should not you know, should, should not be closed off to, to working with hardware appliances. Yeah. Um, so I mean I, I think Dan and I are pretty aligned in it. I, I think that's cheap for the most part. I guess the, 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 I mean I think like Dan was saying I, I'm probably more of the mindset that it'll probably be more at the software layer, um, just because of that that enables more distribution of both load balancer and firewall functions. Um, and if it's not distributed, it's hard to really take full advantage of SDN, um, of the promise of SDN. Okay. So switching gears a bit, just about adoption and where you see the market going today, how fast do you think that customers will actually adopt some of the network virtualization that you see today? Obviously, there's been a handful of use cases and people announcing like eBay, but how far do you think or how long do you think <coughs> it will take to actually get a broader penetration? So just from your guesstimate, when we're talking next fall, 2013, what percentage of OpenStack solutions do you think will have some form of network virtualization in it? Yeah. yeah um, well, so if you read the latest Gartner report, they say that SDN is five to ten years out from mass adoption. Um, so, but, but, but that said, I mean, I think that kind of misses a lot of nuances. So, cloud service providers are obviously adopting it today. Um, you know, enterprises like eBay are starting to play with it, but they are. They're, they, I mean, I think even the more um, you know, sophisticated companies like eBay are still probably three to five years out from mass DSTN adoption. Um, but certainly for specific use cases, I mean, we have large enterprises today that are engaging with us, I mean, today on leveraging SDN principles to be able to, you know, connect to different data centers and burst in. And um, but, but again, that's kind of on a per use case basis, and it is with more of the sophisticated uh, IT4 looking companies. So, you know, I'd probably say three to five years out from mass adoption a little sooner than Gartner, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, I probably don't know if I could be as specific in giving you know, spe you know, specific kind of year guidelines, but obviously you know, this is a new technology and it, it represents a, pa a paradigm shift and a huge opportunity. So you're gonna see kind of a, you know, an early adopter to, you know, an early adopter to mainstream model that follows most other technologies. So I, I would think of, you know, I was probably in a minority of folks here, and you know, I was at the first VMworld conference, um, you know, you know, essentially rolling out hypervisors for people that were not used to running them. And that technology, you know, you know, 
took a, a number of years to kind of mature, and now it, you know, now it essentially dominates the industry, and I think we're going to end up seeing that with software-defined networking as well. It really will redefine what's going on in networking. Uh, and, you know, there'll be a number of use cases where it has immediate value and it'll start getting deployed immediately. It, it's being deployed today, in fact. Um, and I think next year we're, you know, we're going to see a, a large number of customers talking about how they deployed SDN. Um, but obviously, in you know, for, for kind of old school enterprises that you know, don't want to change anything, it's going to take them uh, you know, a long time to get comfortable with changing. I'm an engineer, so if you ask me, I think all of them should be adopting SDN by the <laughs> end of next year. <laughs> uh, and if they're not, that's probably because the solutions from vendors like us and others aren't quite ready enough you know, to meet their exact needs. Right? And of course, there's a conservative aspect that kicks in. So uh, I'm just going to focus on figuring it out, what they need, and implementing that. OK, excellent. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, we were kind of talking about this earlier, but there's this whole issue of you know, greenfields versus non-greenfields. And so certainly, you know, so eBay and their latest deployment was for a greenfield dev test you know, solution uh, in-house. And so I, I think we will see more adoption for those greenfield deployments. but. Um, you know, I, I think it, the challenge is that you know vendors such as perhaps us or others need to think about is how do we give um, you know existing customers with large installed uh, network infrastructures a migration path. And so, you know, I guess my prediction is over the next five years we'll see more and more companies come out with migration path solutions. Um, and, and if that were to happen, I think it could rapidly accelerate the adoption that you were saying you hope think makes yeah. sense because. Yeah. Because again, I mean, people are doing it from a greenfield perspective because there's no switching costs. Right, that's true. Excellent. So with that, if there's no in any any audience questions, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. I'm sorry. Could you come to the mic so that we can have a recording? So a lot of us are interested in building like uh, large-scale multi-tenant uh, with separation uh, in the network. Uh, but with open source software, and it sounds like you know, uh, there's there's not much we can do without some sort of proprietary solution. What's what what's actually missing from uh, from the open source implementations that are limiting us from doing this? Uh, I'd actually um, as respectfully disagree. So I, I would say that. You know, um, there are a number of vendors out there that have open source their SDN controllers, and they work well at a limited scale. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I guess if you're operating a very large implementation, then you probably would need to talk to the vendors that have open source those things to say, could I get access to your, you know, commercial solution that might have a database that scales better or things like that. Um, but certainly, if you just want to play play around with something today, there's a bunch of open source stuff that works great. Yeah, and I would, I guess, I would add to that. So, you know, I mentioned Floodlight R. You know, our open source controller, um, you know, is a good starting point. It's not going to be an out of the box solution. It's not designed to be that. And Open vSwitch is also a great a, a great building block. And you know, with those two, you you actually have a lot of the building blocks you'd need to create an an open source SDN solution. Um, but you know, the, you know, like all open source, this is it's a, you know, this is something there would be work on your part to do it. And you know, there's commercial vendors that are offering solutions, but you know, the pieces, a lot of the pieces, are there in open source today. Well, that could that could potentially work at, at like a very large scale with uh, <coughs> Open vSwitch and Floodlight. Potentially, okay. right? This is you know, you know, so you know, th these are the building blocks we're using in our solution too. So um, you know, there's no reason they can't, but. You said, you know, there's, you know, the, it, you know, it's not a package solution, right? It would be work on your part to get it there. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I'd like to thank the audience for, for staying with us the whole time, and especially all of our panelists for all of their knowledge. Thanks. <laughs>